In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. After this, Jesus said to Simon Peter, follow me. As we move through Eastertide, our scriptural readings show us something of how the early church was developing its faith. And the lesson from the Acts of the Apostles reminds us of what the word church primarily means. Not a building, nor an institution. For the heavenly voice told Saul that when he persecuted followers of the way, he was persecuting Jesus himself. The church is the body of believers. And in this body, there is diversity of reflection on the life and meaning of the man from Nazareth who was dead but is alive. The great vision of heavenly worship given us in the revelation of John shows us an early sense that the crucified one must be seen as one who is worthy of divine honor as the heavenly court falls down in worship. Here already we see the Christian faith breaking the bounds of strict monotheism for the cry of the worshippers is to the one seated on, to the th on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. The Acts reading, possibly deliberately, leaves us in suspense. Get up, go to Damascus, and you will be told what to do. In this, we are at the outset of the spread of the gospel through the life and teaching of Paul in yet another burst of divine energy. What a lot of Christian life will spin out from that word to Saul. But we should always remember that Saul, Paul himself, was very reluctant to talk in detail of what happened on the Damascus Road, although he was certainly convinced that God had intervened in his life in both a powerful and humbling way. As we turn to today's gospel reading, we should first recall that last Sunday's gospel was the final section of chapter 20, and it ended with these words. These things are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. Yet our gospel reading for today begins with a sequel, whose opening words are after these things. It gives us a third post-resurrection appearance of the disciples, the previous two being the Sunday gatherings in the upper room on the day of resurrection and a week later. And the story of the catch of fish has similarities with the story told in St. Luke's Gospel, chapter 5, about a miraculous haul of fish as a symbol of the work the disciples are being called to do. There and in today's Gospel, there is no success in catching fish until the Lord is present and his command obeyed. We can also notice in today's Gospel the little detail that Peter being naked while fishing, put on his clothes to greet the risen Lord, even though he jumps into the lake. The symbolism is that one would come properly habited to greet the Lord and attend his feast. And the meal consists of bread and fish, just as in John's account of the feeding of the 5,000. So now the disciples know that it is indeed Jesus, the host, who distributes the food. And then there is that great haul of fish, very great, but not so as to break the net. The fishermen have the right equipment. But why 153? Details like that are not randomly plucked out of the air by a storyteller, particularly in ancient times. There will be some significance. And over the years, various theories have been advanced. One starts from the fact that 153 is what is called a triangular number. 
That's to say, if you make successive rows, starting with one object, then two, then three, and so on, you can arrange them in a neat equilateral triangle. Using 17 rows, you get 153 objects in all. Uh, if you don't believe me, you can add them up, although there is a formula. Then, of course, the question becomes, why 17? Well, we can find a connection with the feeding of the 5,000 because there were five fish to share and 12 baskets were used to gather up the fragments that remained. And, of course, 5 plus 12 is 17. In the type of numerical symbolism that intrigued many ancient writers, and perhaps some of us today, five can also stand for the five books of Moses in the Torah and 12 for the tribes of Israel. So the idea would be that the story is indicative of the life of the new Israel. All this may or may not be the case, but it is plausible because it is how people's minds often worked. Another explanation was given by the great biblical scholar St. Jerome, who flourished in the latter half of the fourth century. In his commentary on Ezekiel, he quoted some earlier writers who said that the total number of varieties of fish in nature was 153. So in this understanding, the number in the catch represents completeness. Whatever the case, fulfillment or completeness, the symbolism is that the whole is gathered in by the disciples at the command of the risen Lord, who discloses himself in the breaking of the bread. We might also be reminded of the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, who knew the Lord in the breaking of the bread. Breaking of bread and sharing in the body of Christ is one of the earliest ways in which Christians call to mind our Lord and proclaim his death and resurrection. There is still more in our gospel. Peter must be restored and commissioned after his denials. <clears throat> Excuse me. We notice that Jesus does not call him Peter, the rock, because he has denied the Lord three times. The rock had not stood fast. So he is called Simon, son of John, Simon bar Jonah his name before his call, and three times he must confess his love of the Lord and receive his commission to feed and, send and tend the flock, a trust which will be sealed by the manner of his death. Our gospel reading is almost at an end with Peter's restoration by the risen Lord, but there is still more, for the Lord makes mention of Peter's death before repeating the command follow me. It's a bit of a pity that we don't read the remaining few verses of chapter 21 because they help us to understand the purpose of this chapter as an appendix to the gospel. For these remaining verses refer to the beloved disciple in continuation of the two contrasting complementary characters that have run through the gospel several times in the gospel of John there is an interplay between the beloved disciple and Peter. Who had sat close to Jesus at the Last Supper? Who first looked into the tomb and saw and believed? Who recognizes the Lord first at the lakeside? In each case, it is the beloved disciple, whereas Peter, the leader of the disciples, seems to be the one who acts after the beloved disciple has discerned the situation. We have a parable of faith and action, rather like that of Martha and Mary in the house of Lazarus. And Peter, however, cannot restrain his curiosity. Lord, what about this one, he asked, this one being the beloved disciple? Not your concern, the Lord effectively replies, giving rise to a tradition that that disciple would not die, a tradition which these final verses dismiss. So we can see how this chapter 21 of the gospel is a later appendix to the original gospel, probably from the early second century. The church's reflection on the things concerning Jesus has never stopped. 
and we join in our wondering with those who saw him and those who have come after as we reflect on the question, who is this? The New Testament was fashioned in the emerging life and struggles of the early church. It is a living collection of documents telling a never-ending story, understood afresh in every age, but always centered on the faith that Jesus lives and makes himself known to those who seek him. Jesus said to Peter, follow me. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>